Hello, welcome to part three of polynomial functions and their graphs. Now in part one we talked about the characteristics of a polynomial graph and the importance of leading terms, how it tells you how the end behavior of a polynomial graph will look. Then in the second part we proved how that works algebraically to prove that any two polynomials of the same degree have the same end behavior. And now we're going to look at the importance of both Real, the real zeros of a polynomial function and the multiplicity of the factors. So these are two things uh, that are tied together nicely and first of all let's look at the zeros. Zeros of a polynomial function. Polynomial function. Okay, so this is familiar territory for many of you because it's reminiscent and reflective of the way we think about the roots of a quadratic function. And what we're, what we're talking about is that if you have a polynomial, so let's say if P is a polynomial, so you have some function, it's a polynomial, and let's say C is a value that is real. So we're talking about real, not complex roots here. Then the following, the following are well, they all mean the same thing. Are all, are all equivalent? The following statements are all equivalent. And what can we say? Well, let's say if C is a real number and you know that C is a real zero of the polynomial. That's the first thing. That's the first way you might say it. So if you say that, if that's true, it, another way of saying that is that if you plug in x equals C, that is a solution of, or two of, say, P of x equals zero. So if you plug in the value of c to the function, you'll get an output of 0 because it's a root. So that means literally the height of it or output is 0. That also means, if we subtract c on both sides here, x minus c equals 0 is a factor of the polynomial. And that's based on the factor theorem, which we'll talk more about. And another way to look at this is that x equals c is an x-intercept. So if one of these, are, if you're saying one of these are true, if you're finding one of them, they're all equivalent to each other, so they all um, are true. If one of them is true, all of them, is all of them are true. So for example, if you had a simple polynomial, let's just do p of x equals x minus 3 times x plus 3. So this quadratic has two roots at positive 3 and negative 3. And um, at if you plugged in 0 to this, that would get you negative 9. So down here, you get a polynomial kind of like this. It's not to scale, but here's the idea. You could say that positive and negative 3 are zeros of the polynomial function. You could also say, therefore, that x equals positive 3 or negative 3 solves solves p of x equals 0. So if you plug in a plus 3, 3 minus 3 is 0, the whole thing is 0. Plug in negative 3, negative 3 plus 3 is 0, the whole thing is 0. So it solves for when p of x equals 0. You could also say that x equals positive and negative 3 are, oh, nope, <laughs> x plus 3 or x minus 3, x plus or minus 3 are factors of p of x. They divide evenly into it. Here's the two factors. You multiply them, you get p of x. All right, they're factors. Then you can also say that x equals plus or minus 3 are x-intercepts of polynomial functions, which you can see right here. You see this is one intercept at positive 3, the other intercept is at negative 3. That's what they're talking about right here. Now, the whole idea is that with these polynomial functions, we're talking about their graphs, right? We're talking about what they look like visually. So the zeros are, are clearly important because they represent turning points in the graph between positive and negative values. 
Like that's pretty critical. And this relates to the um, intermediate value theorem. Just mention this. So the, um, I think I have room here. So I'm going to slide here. The intermediate value theorem. What this theorem says is, let's do a little picture here. Suppose you have a graph. Um, like this. And what you know about the graph is at some input A, here's the output P of A, and then at some input B, here's the output up here, so just here, here's P of B. And what we know is that P of A and P of B, all we know is they have opposite signs. Okay, so they're opposite. Maybe in this case P of A is negative, P of B is positive, but the signs are opposite. That means that there exists at least one point, right, one value C between A and B for which P of C is zero, right? So, and that makes sense, right? If P of A is negative, P of B is, is positive, and it's a continuous function, there are no breaks, breaks. To get from a negative to a positive, we have to cross zero. We have to cross a root of the polynomial. And that's what the intermediate value theorem states, the IVT theorem states. Um, so if, I'll write it down, if P is a polynomial function and P of A and P of B have opposite signs, then there exists at least, there might be more than one, at least one value C between A and B where P of C equals zero. And there could be more than one. We don't know if there are other switches, right? Maybe it was like this, for example. But there, actually I drew it so there's still one. If I drew it like this, it could be, right, two values where uh, the polynomial equals zero. But there has to be at least one. In other words, there's no way to get from positive to negative or negative to positive on a continuous function unless you're crossing zero, which is where the, the zeros or roots come into play. They end up being those critical points. And what we start to learn is that there's also something critical about the powers of the factors that make up your polynomial. So let's say you have, this is where multiplicity comes into play. It's a really important concept, multiplicity. So cool. And this multiplicity is referring to the degree of the factors of a polynomial. Degree of the factors of a polynomial. Now the amazing thing is that the degree of a factor tells you if the polynomial will cross the x-axis or bounce back. And there's essentially two cases. And we use m for multiplicity. If m is even, then the polynomial doesn't cross the x-axis at the 0. If m, and I'll show you what I mean in a moment, if m is odd, the polynomial does cross the x-axis at the zero. All right, so what, what am I talking about? Suppose you have some kind of polynomial function, p of x, and we've factored it already. Here it is, 2x to the fourth times x minus 2 cubed times x plus 1 squared. This is a cubed. So the multiplicity values are right here. These are the degrees of the factors. So this tells me, first of all, at x equals 0, right, m equals 4 at 
x equals 0. The multiplicity is 4 at this root. When m equals 3, it's odd at the value at x equals 2, at that 0. And over here, m equals 2, it's even at x equals negative 1. Now this is incredibly powerful, right? Because now we can sketch this polynomial very quickly. Here's what it might look like. So we know the leading term, the degree, is, well, it's not 4, actually. I don't know. I shouldn't have labeled that. The degree we should look at as well. The degree of this polynomial is, let's, let's write this out, the degree. You have to look at the highest power of x that we would obtain if we ended up multiplying these factors. What's the highest power that we would reach? So we look at x to the fourth, eventually, times x cubed times x squared. All I'm saying is that eventually, in this polynomial, you're going to multiply x to the fourth times x to the third times x squared, because here you have an x to the fourth. Here you are cubing x eventually and then squaring x eventually. So you're going to encounter some factor where those three things are multiplied, and that gives you x to the, you add the exponents, ninth which means the, the degree equals 9. It's a ninth degree polynomial, and the leading coefficient is positive, since 2 is greater than 0, right? This is our leading coefficient. It's positive. So it's going to look something like a cubic polynomial with that n behavior. But it has roots at 0. Let's highlight that. At 0. At 2, 1, 2. And at negative 1 here. So now we start to get a rough sketch of what's happening. And our polynomial, let's do a better job here. I know it's going to come up from down here. And I'm going to use a better pen. Let's come up, up, up. And what does it do here at negative 1? Let's see what it says. At negative 1, the multiplicity is even. So it bounces back. It bounces back. And you'll see why this is amazing in a moment. And then at 0, the multiplicity is even again. So it comes up some, it dips down some, it comes back up, and then bounces back. And then at, at 2, the multiplicity is odd, so it's going to cross the axis right here. So it looks something like this. So here we have the same graph on Desmos. And I just want to highlight that there's some amazing things going on here with the multiplicity. These are our zeros. And we could say, all right, well, if the multiplicity is even, the polynomial bounces back, bounces back. And then if it's odd, it goes through. And that's really cool that that happens, right? But what's even more amazing is that the polynomial function here takes on the shape of the degree of the factor near the root. It takes on the shape. So let's go through this. So our first root is at negative 1. That's this factor here, and it has a degree of 2, a multiplicity of 2. So if we zoom in to that root, you will start to notice that really close to that root, this polynomial function looks like a second degree polynomial. It looks like a parabola, and that's no accident. This will always happen. When you have a polynomial and you factor it out, look at the degree of the factor, look at that multiplicity, and that'll tell you the shape of the polynomial near that root. And that's something we can prove using calculus, but here we're just gonna state it. It's an amazing and beautiful thing. Math is full of lovely surprises like that. And you can see here as we approach zero, this polynomial kind of takes on like a flatter curve. It's still almost parabolic, but it looks a lot more like a fourth degree polynomial. The fourth degree polynomial has that wider and flatter shape to it. And then as we go over to two, oh my gosh, right, third degree factor, it looks like a cubic near that root. So not only does it cross when the multiplicity is odd, when the multiplicity is three, it looks cubic. When it's 2, it looks parabolic. When it's the 4th degree, it looks like a cortic. And this, I mean, I don't know. It just blows my mind. Now, we're not exactly capturing the value of local mins and maxes here. You'd have to plug inputs into the polynomial at this point to see how high or how low it's going. But really what we're hoping is you'll capture that end behavior and be able to use the multiplicity to tell us when this polynomial will turn and which way it'll respond when it reaches a root. And this is in contrast to how we might normally have done this to figure out what a polynomial is doing. So for example, here with this polynomial, what would we have done without this tool? We would have written down the polynomial, maybe factored it out or something, 
say this, say 2x to the fourth times x minus 2 cubed times x plus 1 squared. You would identify that the roots are 0 and 2 and negative 1, but then to figure out what the polynomial does around those roots, if you didn't know anything about n behavior or zeros and multiplicity and how they relate to each other, you'd have to sketch this out, plug it in the calculator, or test it point by point. You have to plug in around your zeros, which is negative 1, 0, and let's say 2. You have to pick a value below negative 1, let's say p of negative 2. Plug it in and say, oh, it's less than 0. You'd have to plug in a value between negative 1 and 0, say negative 1 half, and say, oh, it's, it's still less than 0. And then you'd go between 0 and 2 and plug in, let's say, 1 and say, oh, that's less than 0. And then after 2, you have to plug in 3 and say, oh, it's finally greater than 0. And knowing that the only time, if you look at the inter intermediate value theorem, the only time you could cross between a positive and a negative is to go through a root. You would then know there are no other crossings since there are no other real roots. So that then you would kind of infer that the shape of the polynomial is positive, coming down, right? It would go through the root here, bounce, bounce, and then go towards negative. So there's no other values we have to test. We only need to test one value in each interval to see if it's positive or negative, because we know it can't cross to positive or negative again unless it goes through a root. So that's, I mean, that workaround right there would require a lot more plugging in. When you have the multiplicity, you can just say, oh, it's an even polynomial, the degree is even, yay. I know the shape of it, it's something like this. It's doing stuff. It's crossing at 0, negative, uh, zero 2, and negative 1. And whenever it's even, right, it's going to bounce back off the axis. Whenever it's odd, it's going to go through. And furthermore, the shape of the polynomial is very similar um, to the degree of the factor, if that were a polynomial itself. And that's really just amazing. So I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you.